Hello, welcome to lecture two in AP Comparative Government on Power and Authority. As always, in the show notes, there is a link to a note guide if you'd like to follow along with it. Our first question is, of course, what is a state? You know, we can't start to talk about power and authority until we start to understand what is a nation state. And the philosopher Max Weber called a state the organization that maintains a monopoly over the use of violence within its borders. Put more bluntly, states are sovereigns, and we'll get to that more in just a second. But irrespective of the use of violence for a moment, states often include what are called institutions. Institutions are long, stable organizations that help to turn political ideas into policy. A great example of an institution in the six countries that we'll be studying this year is Parliament in Great Britain. Parliament is an institution. It is not, in and of itself, the state. But statehood is inexorably tied to another concept that is critical to understand when evaluating any political system. That is sovereignty. Sovereignty, you probably notice the word sovereign in there, which is another word for king or queen or head of state. And that gives you a really nice hint in terms of what the word itself means. Sovereignty, in one definition, is the ability to carry out actions or policies within given borders, independent from interference from either the inside or the outside. So it means being free from internal disturbances and from external pressures. A state that lacks sovereignty doesn't have autonomy. It can't decide things for itself. A great historic example of this would be the American colonies prior to independence from Great Britain. Prior to independence from Great Britain, the 13 original colonies that would become the United States lacked sovereignty of any kind. They didn't have the political ability to make decisions within their boundaries. So when you're thinking about who has sovereignty and who doesn't have sovereignty, that example of a colony can be really powerful and helpful when it comes to remembering the distinction. Now, if we're looking at more current events, this is a big problem, the lack of sovereignty for newly developing nations. And that's particularly the case, not because of external pressures this time, but because of internal disturbances, namely corruption. There's a good example here where Nigeria's state-run oil and petroleum industries were for years and years and years just treated as the private bank accounts of individuals within the government. What that does was it robbed the citizens of Nigeria of the benefits of all the oil production, which made it impossible to carry out actions and policies within Nigeria because the corruption was so rife that people were just simply not willing to go along with these policies any longer. Therefore, internal corruption can also reduce a state's sovereignty, its ability to be an autonomous country. In fact, in many examples that we'll see, it is internal disturbance and not external pressure that results in a lack of sovereignty. Um, but moving on, let's talk about states versus nations for a second, because the two terms are often used interchangeably, but they're, they're different in a pretty important way. What's a nation? A nation, as it's defined by political scientists, is a group of people bound together by a common political identity. And that gets me to my next term, which is nationalism. Nationalism is a sense of belonging. It's a sense of identity that distinguishes one nation from the other. Easy example here, let me give you one. People who live in France identify as French. That's their nation. 
Their nationalism leads them to do that. Nationalism today is often expressed interchangeably as patriotism. Now, the big counter to nationalism, as we're going to see, is globalization. Globalization balances out nationalism. Now, here's an easy example. There are hundreds of thousands of people in the United States today who do not identify as American, who might identify if you ask them as Irish or Chinese or Mexican. And of course, there are supranational organizations like the EU, the European Union, that tend to undercut nationalism because they're based on the idea of cooperating beyond the boundaries of your nation state. Talk much more about the EU later on. Another term that I want to define here is, because it's used a lot in the textbooks, and that is regime. A regime is, to put it bluntly, the rules that a state establishes and follows when exercising its power. Now, critically, this is not an individual government. For example, if the present parliamentary government right now in Great Britain collapses, requiring new elections, the regime is still there. It persists. The easy thing to remember is RR. Regimes remain. Regimes remain. Unless you have a complete overthrow of the government, the regime is the same. Now, an example of an overthrow of the government would be between 1991 and 1993, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of the new Russian state constitution. That's a regime change. But one political party switching for another, that's not a regime change. And I want to be clear about that. Because colloquially, when you listen to whether it's um, any one of the news television programs or talk radio or something, oftentimes they will use the term regime interchangeably with political parties. We don't do that in AP comparative government and make sure that you understand that. A regime are the rules that the state follows. It's not a political party. Now let's talk about the two big government structures that we're gonna be focusing on in this course. Democracy and authoritarianism. Let's do democracy first. There's two types of general democracies, direct and indirect. In a direct democracy, everyone who can participate votes on every single issue. We don't really have any modern direct democracies. The best example that I could give you would be Classical Athens. Classical Athens in modern day Greece was a direct democracy. All eligible voting citizens, which wasn't everybody by any stretch of the imagination, but all eligible voting citizens voted in the assembly on everything. Most democracies today are indirect, which means you elect the person who votes on your behalf. You don't vote on every bill in Congress or Parliament, right? You elect someone and they vote on your behalf. Now let's talk about the two big democratic systems, parliamentary systems and presidential systems. In a parliamentary system, people elect the legislative branch and the legislative branch then chooses the executive branch. So an example of this, and I'll talk about this a lot more when we talk about Great Britain, is that in Great Britain, you elect members of parliament. Whoever has the majority of the members of parliament in terms of the political parties chooses the prime minister. And England is also a great example of that, of the next part that I wanna talk about. Parliamentary systems often have a distinction between the head of state and the head of government. The head of state, and I put a little crown there to make it easy, is symbolic. They're the symbolic leader of the nation. In the case of Great Britain, that's the present king, Charles III. Head of government is different. The head of government is the person who's in charge of the day-to-day -day affairs of running the show. 
And again, in the case of Great Britain, that's the Prime Minister who right now, at least as I'm speaking in August of 2023, is a gentleman by the name of Rishi Sunak. Now, the presidential system is very different. In a presidential system, people elect separately the legislative and executive branches. This is, of course, the system we use in the United States. It's also the system that they use in Mexico and Nigeria, two of our six countries. Oftentimes, presidential systems are based on two key concepts, checks and balances and separation of power. In the checks and balances, each branch of government, legislative, executive, and depending upon the country we're talking about, sometimes judicial, has the ability to stop the other branches from doing something in some way. We'll get into that in more detail later on. Separation of powers is the other main idea. In separation of powers, power is shared. No one branch is allowed to dominate. Different branches have delineated different roles. Now, that's not the only type of democracy. There's also what has been termed semi-presidential systems, which contains elements of both parliamentary systems and presidential systems. And the key example of this is Russia. Under Russia's 1993 constitution, the prime minister and the president share power. Now, for a long time, the prime minister didn't do much in the Russian system. That changed in 2008 when Vladimir Putin became president. And that'll be something that we talk a lot more about in future lectures. Now let's talk about authoritarian regimes. In an authoritarian regime, a series of elites, political elites, people with power, hold all the government authority with little to no input from the citizens. There's a number of different types of these. There's a communist authoritarian regime in which the communist party in the nation state controls everything that happens. There's also what's called corporatism. Corporatism is an arrangement wherein the government and officials interact with people and groups outside the government before setting state policy. Usually, these follow what's called a patron-client system. A patron-client system is pretty easy if you understand the terms. It's a system in which outside groups and their leaders agree to provide support. In return, the people in charge of the authoritarian regime give those groups, and especially their leaders, favors and services. So it's very much a quid pro quo situation here. There are four common characteristics to an authoritarian regime. It's good to know them. They're going to come up on the test. Number one, there's always a small group of elites with power over the state. Number two, citizens have little to no input in their government. Number three, Leaders have no constitutional responsibility to the public. And number four, there are big, big restrictions on the civil liberties and civil rights of ordinary citizens. Now, something that always comes up is this question of authoritarianism versus totalitarianism. Totalitarian regimes seek to control all aspects of the political and economic systems of their societies. Authoritarian regimes do not. All right? It's a totalitarian regime. A perfect example would be Nazi Germany, a system that ideologically driven tries to control all aspects of society. Not Every authoritarian regime is totalitarian. Every totalitarian regime is authoritarian, but not vice versa. 
there's a couple of aspects to this. There's what's called military rule. Military rule is a system, a government system, in which the military intervenes directly in the government. Very common in Latin America, Africa, and parts of Asia. Almost always results in some form of an authoritarian regime. It can result in a totalitarian regime, but it doesn't have to. Another term I want you to know is coup d'etat. A coup d'etat is a forceful taking of power. In military rule, and oftentimes an authoritarian regime, especially if you're transitioning from a democracy to an authoritarian regime, starts with a coup d'etat, a forceful taking of power in some ways. Think like the assassination of an elected uh, president and his or her replacement with a military strongman. That would be an example of a coup d'etat. Now I want to talk a little bit about a couple of other terms that are related to these ideas of democracy and authoritarianism. The first is modern corporatism, which is related to authoritarian governments. Modern corporatism is the method through which business, labor, and sometimes other business groups bargain with the state over state policy. It tends to make the state look less authoritarian. The best example that we have of this that's useful for our six countries is Pemex. Pemex, which is P-E-M-E-X, is Mexico's state-run petroleum industry. When it was founded, essentially all the private gas companies, all the private petroleum companies were given the boot. They were kicked out of Mexico. And Mexico's petroleum and gas industry became entirely state-run. It is technically a private company, but it's run under the auspices of the state. So it gives the company a veneer of legitimacy, which is something, again, we'll talk about later on. Now let's call, talk about co-optation. Co-optation is a general term that I just wanted to put in at this point. It's the means by which a regime uses to get support from its citizens. Co-optation can work in a number of different ways. You can do it economically, wherein the citizens support a regime in exchange for financial benefits, in exchange for economic prosperity, and so on and so forth. Um, you can do it with um, patriotism and nationalism. You, you support the government in exchange for big uh, shows of patriotism and so on and so forth. Oftentimes this could be associated with a war, with othering, right? It's a term we'll come back to a lot. Uh, next, I want to talk about patron clientism because this is the, we see this a ton in our six countries. This is essentially a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy system. It's like a pyramid scheme. So imagine a, a pyramid with the elite government officials at the very tip top. What it does is it confers benefits on certain individuals in exchange for support. So you give the government support and they give you something, something physical in return. Financial benefits, uh, might be a legal benefit, might be um, a way around the legal system. It might be as a owner of a company in exchange for supporting the overall regime, what they will do is they'll say, well, you don't have to pay that tax, or maybe that environmental regulation won't apply to you this year. So it's a patron client system, whereas the patrons are giving something to the clients in exchange for support. There are tons of examples of this in China, Russia, Mexico, and Nigeria. I'll talk about them later on. Uh, the second to last thing I want to talk about is pluralism versus democratic corporatism. These are kind of new ideas. Well, pluralism isn't. Pluralism is the idea, and you can kind of see the word plural in it. That means more than one. It means different groups competing for the chance to influence the state's decision making. I'll talk about the United States for this one because it's an easy example. We have interest groups. 
different interest groups, which are private, try, usually through money, to compete for the ability to shape state policy. That's what they do. We have interest groups on all kinds of things. Industry, the environment, gun control, medical procedures, and other items. That we have it for everything. It's out there. Now, the difference is democratic corporatism isn't necessarily the same, but it doesn't have to be associated with authoritarianism. Democratic corporatism is usually grounded in economic planning and regulation. It's still competition. So there's still different groups competing for state interest, but it's different in two key ways. For one, institutional recognition is only possible through the state. So let me give you an example. Democratic corporatism would be like if the United States government would only allow legislators to talk with individuals from interest groups if that interest group had been recognized by the state. So if your interest group, um, let's say your environmentalist, has not been recognized by the state, you would not even get a seat at the table. There would be no way for you to have any influence whatsoever. The second change or difference is that those interest groups tend to become semi-public, which means they become less independent. Because once you are accepted by the state, you get these legally binding links with state agencies. And these legally binding links sort of fuse this private interest group with the state in a different way. We'll see examples of this. Just know the idea for right now between pluralism and democratic corporatism, because it's going to come up over and over again. The last thing I want to talk about is a term that gets used a lot in the textbook, and it's used a lot in the text, which is democracy index. So democracy index. The democracy index is something that you can look up right now. Essentially, it's a ranking. It ranks countries around the globe in terms of democratic practices. It has five categories that they look at. Electoral processes, civil liberties, how the government functions, political participation, and overall political culture. Most of these I'll talk about later on in more detail. And then what it does is it looks at how the democracy is functioning based on those five categories. And it gives you a score. And that score is full democracy, flawed democracy, hybrid, or authoritarian. If we look at our six countries, right now, the only one of the six that qualifies as a full democracy is the United Kingdom. Mexico qualifies as a flawed democracy. Nigeria, Russia, China, and Iran are all classified as authoritarian regime. You might be interested to know this, but of all the nations in the world, according to this index, only 20 are full democracies.